Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. I'm so happy to welcome back returning guest, Kurt Anderson, who, of course, was on just a few, I guess, a month and a half ago. We talked about your book, Fantasyland, and then I promised I would get a hold of your book, Evil Geniuses, which I did. I read it, and so I'm here to talk to you about Evil Geniuses. Well, it is my pleasure to return, Clint, because, uh, you know, you were that was a great conversation the first time, and as, I don't know, I don't want to spoil whatever you're going to ask me, but, but you know, they, they go together. I mean, I, I regard these books, even though I didn't start out thinking of them this way, but they are they are a kind of paired set. Mm -hmm. So that's the question then. How is it a sequel to Fantasyland? Because I wasn't sure what I was going to expect either. When I started going through uh, Evil Geniuses, I thought, okay, where can he go from Fantasyland? Yeah. But um, I, I was quite surprised at the depth, really. I thought it was, it was almost more of an academic study in that sense. All, you did so much research for this yeah. book. Well, I did with both, and I'd never—I had never written big history books before. I'd written a couple of little nonfiction books, but you know, I'd written novels uh, mm -hmm. in terms of big books, and so yeah, it was—it was, it was uh, a challenge to because you know there, I, I really felt with each of them that they were like my own sort of self-guided master's degree programs mm. because I, I really I did with both have to spend a couple of years just teaching myself what I didn't know and what I needed to mm -hmm. know because so this really started. I started thinking about maybe there's another book to do here about about what's befallen America the last 50 years. And it really came to kind of fruition or, or germinated, really, uh, when I was out in fall of 2017 talking about Fantasyland. And uh, I remember this woman at a at a, you know, I, I did a reading and there were questions and mm -hmm. she said and she said, well, I, I, I get it. And I'm eager to read it. But. Um, isn't it? Isn't, for instance, the the belief that there's no such thing as global warming, the the climate change denial, isn't that a result of lots and lots of money by billionaires, by the Koch brothers, being spent, mm. uh, rather than you know. Uh, your theory that Americans are just credulous idiots. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, you know, you, you got a point. It's probably both. But but my 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 answer to her at the time was, well, you know, uh, if you'd had the Koch brothers money poured into, you know, other countries, let's say Canada or or I don't know, Denmark or what? Pick your country. Um, it wouldn't have had the effect. It, it was a kind of synergistic effect that the people with power and money, who are my evil geniuses, used this condition that had arisen in the United States over the last few decades to get their way. And so I, I realized, I mean, they're not, so it's not exactly a, a sequel, but they are two halves, right? I mean, Fantasyland mm -hmm. was about the problem of irrationalism and and over subjectivity yeah. and all that magical stuff. Magical thinking. Magical thinking. And and this was this was in a certain way the opposite because it's about this small group of incredibly rational people, not magical thinkers at all, who mm -hmm. decided back in the starting in the 1970s that they uh, wanted to transform the rules of the game of the American economic system and mm -hmm. did so. So, so you know, it's uh, th 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 they are both uh, th studies of and uh, of of what went wrong in America, right? Mm -hmm. And what one is more, I mean, they're both as you've read them both. They both have cultural elements, but Fantasyland is more cultural, and and obviously, Evil Genius is more about mm -hmm. economics and politics. Yeah, political economy. That's what kind of struck me out as you just articulated. As I as I went through the first several chapters, I kept thinking, okay, what's his sort of thesis? What's his argument? And you got all this information coming coming at the reader or the listener. In this case, I listened to it on Audible. But I, that's what struck me was uh, it, it seems like that's the thesis of your book, isn't it? That 
there it's it's no secret that there's a vast inequality between the wealthy the uber wealthy and the rest of americans but that didn't happen by accident that was like you say it was a plot a plan or not a conspiracy theory but it was intentional in it was it, it, it was orchestrated and intentional exactly right and of course it was a it was a strange place to go with this companion book to Fantasyland because so much of Fantasyland is about like most mm-hmm. conspiracy theories are preposterous. Don't you know? Really, don't believe in you know. Th- yes, there are some conspiracies, but don't believe every one that comes along and all that. And and I and I part of me realized that my temperamental uh, disbelief in conspiracy theories of the traditional nutty kind had kind of blinded me to the fact that there was this orchestrated deliberate uh you know campaign mm-hmm. by the, the you know big business and 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 right-wing billionaires and 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 you know earnest libertarian zealots of various kind to to change america and to roll back what had been you know a, a very successful prosperous mm-hmm. uh, america that came out of the new deal so it was it was it was funny for, for essentially as, as somebody as more than one person has said to me like well hey you write up one book saying that conspiracy theories are a bunch of nonsense and here then you're spending a whole book positing the conspiracy theory right, and, it's all a conspiracy <laughs> well you know and 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 it, again it, it, part of what i think is important is and i at the end of the book i talk about you know the, the problems of non-binary or the problems of binary thinking that we should be more non-binary and 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 it's true of this subject too right i mean that it's not either n- not a conspiracy or a total conspiracy it, it it didn't just happen but it wasn't like eight guys in a room for 30 years you know like yeah. mr burns on the simpsons or anything but as again there were more of those eight guys in a room scenes than i ever had any mm-hmm. knowledge of yeah maybe mr burns was in there with well, dracula and <laughs> practically, practically everybody else you know <laughs> excellent uh, yeah. i'm a huge simpsons fan so uh, <laughs> yeah i can resonate with that well it seemed like you're talking about in the book that the groundwork sort of is laid in the 70s it's kind of enacted in the 80s and then really put into place in the 90s so by the time you come around to the last what 20 years this system is firmly embedded and one of the things you you keep saying is america has a political economy it's not just a quote economy is it in what way is it a political economy well all all, everyone all countries have political economies Mm -hmm. the problem with talking just about the economy is that it it has this neutral character like oh you know that there aren't political choices and policy decisions made all along the way about how much the wealth should be shared how high the tax rates should be how much you know private interests versus public interests where where that balance should so all of those are are political choices and and so i think it and i think it's important for all of us to think of to think about the system in that way, uh, that it's not just, oh, economics is economics, and and that there is only one way even to organize a free market capitalist system. I mean, I, mm-hmm. as I explained, there are many, many very distinct flavors of that from the Nordic countries to the UK, to America, to Canada. I mean, it, it's done differently. So I think mm-hmm. it's just, it's important to, and I, and I, and I make that point early on at the beginning of the book to say, yeah, it's, it's politics. It's not just, it's not like the economics and the free market system are not like some, some, you know, given piece of nature, you know, Mm -hmm. there are choices made and in every society, the governments, either democratically or not, create the rules by which business happens and jobs Mm -hmm. are are created or not and all that. So, you know, that's what I mean by political economy. Mm hmm. Well, and it strikes me that you're arguing in the book that these people, I mean, not these Mr. Burns in a room somewhere, but, but there there were people, no doubt about it, that met in boardrooms and wherever that put together a strategy by which they could they could enact it politically because it wouldn't have happened. It seems like you're saying in the book without certain political moves and legislation that then favored big business, that tax cuts for the wealthy, those things don't just happen by accident, do they? 
Right. No, it was 100 percent. And and I, see what I didn't know, because I, I should have been paying, paying closer attention. But, it, you know, it to some degree, it takes looking back in retrospect to see it. But mm. but OK, I, I'm I'm 25 years old. Ronald Reagan is elected president. Oh, that's a big deal. That's a big change. But I I've, I I hadn't realized the degree to which it the, the 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 groundwork was really significantly built from 1970 on, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, and and that's people don't know that very much that that it wasn't just oh right reagan came along we elected him and we cut taxes and everything was yeah, about deregulation economics, yeah <laughs> yeah there was this building of this of this new paradigm and this counter establishment that took a whole decade mm. and what well, as i lay out in the story you know at first in 1970 71 when uh, liberalism and leftism and consumer um, uh, rights and all the rest were, were still, you know, liberalism was still having its moment. So and these a lot of these guys, the, 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 the billionaires, the CEOs thought, my God, we're going to be swept away in some kind of socialist revolution. Mm. 1970. Oh, oh. And, and so at first, I, I mean, to be fair to them, I guess, even though they were hysterical, uh, that they really it was let's save ourselves. We let's let's put up barriers to prevent this mm. uh, socialist transformation of the United States. And then that, you know, in a in a fair, in a short matter of time, in a few years, that that was no longer happening. You know, by the mid 70s, that that was not happening. And Jimmy Carter was elected as a conservative Democrat, really. Mm. Um, so that, at that point, they decided, wow, this has worked well for a few years. Let's just keep going. Let's just keep pushing it. Let's see how far we can get to to make the, the Franklin Roosevelt, New Deal, you know, Social Security, Medicare, all of that stuff that is help make, <laughs> dare I say it, America great. Um, uh, Oh, let, dare, let's, dare. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's see if we can roll that back and make that look obsolete. And 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 because people have all all kinds of different people, Americans have all kinds of different reasons to be angry at the government, especially coming off the late 60s. Right. So let's the right said the evil genius has said, let's try to focus that to help us. Like if you hate gun control, good. You can be part of our thing. If you or, you know, if you uh, uh, don't like the, the, the local government t taxing you too much with property taxes, you're on our side. So by 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 having a long project of undermining trust in government, which had already taken a couple of big blows, but from Watergate and the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. they, 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 they were all about undermining trust in government such that their program, which didn't, they didn't care about abortion, they didn't care about gun control, they didn't care about mm -hmm. all of that stuff that so many of their new supporters did. They just wanted no regulation on business and taxes as low as possible on on themselves as individuals and their businesses, which which was done you know, in a in a autumn, you know, the taxes were cut by half after having from where they had been since the World War Two. So mm -hmm. so so that's what happened. And and then, as you say, I mean, starting in the 70s, too, and I was aware of it at the time. But again, looking back, uh, it, it, it's clearer to me. Democrats in the United States were also uh, starting to to talk about like Gary Hart, who had, you know, became ran for Senate, became a senator in the mm -hmm. early 70s, was saying, oh, the New Deal, that's that's old and obsolete. We can't think about uh, things that way anymore. Yeah, unions, they're old fashioned. We don't need unions anymore. All of this. Uh, so so by the time, you know, by the 90s, certainly there was no difference effectively between most Democratic politicians and most Republican politicians on on what were the you know the 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 axiomatic principles of mm. of of economics so suddenly there are plenty of people who you know working people who for whom the democratic party had always been the party of the working man and woman uh no longer there was there was both of them both parties were were not didn't have their backs economically mm. both neither party was really you know uh, affiliated strongly with the trade union movement and on and on and on or you know so so it became a, a political disaster it was then it could be well which which of these parties hates the same people you hate more oh mm -hmm. you know and and for a lot of working white working people it was 
The Republicans, right. the Republicans, and 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 the the, the Democrats aren't going to help me economically. The Republicans probably aren't either. But at least we hate the same people. And <laughs> yeah. forty years later, here we are. Here the we same, are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who are some of these evil geniuses? Because certain names come up. You say back in the sixties and seventies that laid the groundwork. The people like Ayn Rand and all that. But Milton Friedman, that name comes up yeah. over and over and over. You talk about the Friedman Doctrine. Yeah. What is the Friedman Doctrine and why is that so important to then what came down the pipeline later? Yeah. Milton Friedman was was an interesting character, really interesting character. You know, he, he, mm -hmm. he came of age in the during the New Deal, worked for the New Deal as his sort of first job of economics school, uh, but then had a lifelong crusade to get rid of the New Deal and get rid of government intervention to help people that he, he, he worshiped the idea of the free market taken to the max. He was until, you know, the 60s, 1960s. So for the first 25, 30 years of his professional life, he was a really well regarded economist, uh, but but a fringe character. You know, he, he was not he was not in the mainstream. He was the one, you know, libertarian right wing economist of mm -hmm. in the in the uh, pantheon of legit American economists. Uh, but but again, he and his his followers and his and some important allies uh, were building, 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 creating societies, creating, you know, you know, they were they were outcasts effectively, but through mm. the 40s and 50s and, uh, or, you know, we're working at it. And then suddenly in the 1960s, when anything goes, including Milton Friedman's right wing economics, mm -hmm. you know, he had a he had standing like, hey, well, let's look at this. Let's maybe the, maybe there's something to this. And so 1970, the fall of 1970, the height of, you know, new left mm -hmm. agitation in America. Uh, Counterculture. Uh, yeah. 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 The New York Times Magazine, uh, you know, the very epitome of elite journalism um, publishes this five or six page uh, takeout by Milton Friedman called the Friedman Doctrine, in which he basically summarizes in a few thousand words what he had been writing more academically for economists mm -hmm. for years and, and, and said, just absolutely said, all of this talk that companies have any obligation to help society, to clean the environment, to help black people, to any, any of these social responsibilities are nonsense. A company has no responsibility whatsoever except to make profits period end of story and anybody any business person who's doing anything else is 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 a is a socialist mole i mean it was it was extreme and extreme even for the time and and here it is in the new york times so it was a it was a it was a, you know it was a little over 50 years ago that it that it that it came out and it was like a really a a, a cannon shot uh mm -hmm. that uh you know excited people of his uh, 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 who, who agreed with them, and, and especially this little coterie of rich billionaires like Charles Koch and David mm -hmm. Koch, these these heirs to a big oil and coal fortune, who became, in addition to building their big, uh, their father's company into a bigger company, uh, became political activists, uh, and other other the, the John Olin, another uh, heir to a to a chemical fortune. And, and there, there, there are a whole bunch of these guys who who starting in the early 70s said we got we, we have to, we're, we may have survived the late 60s, but we have to really build a new counter establishment. Mm -hmm. There was this again, another thing that I that I that I didn't know about until I started working on this book, uh, this thing called the Powell memo, which is as I say in the book, it's it's in fiction. It wouldn't be believable that <laughs> that in 1971, this big, you know, uh, kind of uh, establishment lawyer, Lewis Powell, who Richard Nixon, President Nixon was about to name to the Supreme Court, would be commissioned by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to write a report on how do we save the free enterprise system? It's it's being going to be brought down by all these radicals and commies and hippies. And he does. He, he's he's he, you know, he's a, he's a very successful lawyer. And he writes this very clear, you know, 50 page long program of here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to do in the universities. Here's what we need to do in the media. Here's what we need to do in lobbying in Washington, on and on and on, saying, here's the plan, boys. Mm -hmm. And and and. 
you know, it, it didn't get that much. I mean, first of all, it was confidential at first in 1971, and it, it was then it was leaked a year later. But it was still seemed like some oh, some cranky right winger fringe thing, and it so it didn't get that much attention. However, it became virtually scripture for for this group of of influential rich uh, right wingers who who wanted to to turn the clock back and 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 uh, and it's just it's 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 amazing because it, it really look at looking back at it I mean if again I wasn't familiar with it when lots of people became familiar with it in the 1990s but it, it must have been just like a Rosetta Stone of what had just happened right of, of, of this this plan that and it's the kind of thing as I say that makes you think like well okay maybe not a conspiracy but like um it, it yeah, the, wait the, a minute. <laughs> but but there's some but there's some organization going on here and 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 just playing a long game I mean that's the other thing they, they kept their eye on the ball and and just played a long game to get what they wanted which is very simple more money and power for us less government regulation on what we do period mm -hmm. it's simple yeah. as Lower opposed taxes. to this the yeah the sprawling democratic platforms and, and agendas <laughs> yeah. are all over the map whereas this is really simple and all this other stuff like you know abortion or 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 the culture war stuff or all all the all the we're, those are those are distractions i mean mm -hmm. they, they are that that my guys my my characters the evil geniuses um were you know where it was it was the price of of the political price they had to pay to get the, the mm -hmm. uh, people to join their 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 program, right? And and as you say, the fact that they were so wealthy to begin with, people like the Koch brothers and some of these other evil geniuses who pick up things like the Friedman Doctrine, it's like a manifesto in a way, isn't it? And yeah, then totally. the fact that they can fund so many things, because you talk about the establishment of, of these conservative right wing think tanks that start churning out papers and journal articles and magazines and things like that. And it starts becoming more and more and more mainstream political action committees, lobbying groups, hiring people who know the system to go back in ex congressmen, ex senators, ex, you know, people that were in politics, who know how to, you know, walk the work, the corridors of power, as it were. So all of this is all funded by this. I don't know if it's dark money, but, well, but that, that, a lot that, of it's untraceable, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the phrase wasn't used then. And and there was no back in the 70s. Well, until the mid 70s, there was no campaign finance uh, yeah. uh, regulation to speak of. But no, they, they, they uh, you know, you have it exactly right. And and uh, they, they kept at it. And it wasn't it wasn't this. Oh, my gosh, we have to win this election. It was. This is a generational project, and they and yeah. they saw it that way, and they kept at it. And yes, and and a little money goes a long way. I mean, if you have you know multiple billions of dollars, you know you can you can get a lot done with you know spending fifty <laughs> yeah. or a hundred million a year to build a build a program in this fancy law school here or 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 start more media there. Because until this happened, I mean, there were there, there wasn't much. I mean, the National Review, William F. Buckley's magazine, mm -hmm. was kind of the conservative media platform, you know. And 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 you know, it was uh, there was one conservative think tank, but it wasn't anything like what these guys created uh, during the '70s and '80s in terms of these uh, really partisan uh, political bodies. So yeah, they, they, they just changed the game. And, and uh, the, you know, as I say at the end of the book, I mean, there's a lot to learn from them. You know, if we want to change it back, they, 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 you know, you can't just do everything they did but opposite. But, but there is, it, it is it, there's a lot of lessons to be learned about, as I say, playing a long game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me so much of the Christian dominionist strategy. I mean, I know that's not what you talk about in the book, but it's like what we're seeing in Texas, for example. All that's been predicated by the appointment of Supreme Court justices, and all this was set in motion decades ago. It's not an accident, you know, and the timing was just right. Now, you mentioned trade unions. What about the trade unions? Because in a way, they seem like you talk about it's it's a it's a necessary corrective to some of these early, you know, guys like Rockefeller and uh, you know Carnegie and some of these barons back in the late 19th century, and then comes out of the early 20th century. The trade unions were desperately needed to bring some equality to the workers, but then what happened? Corruption sets in, and all these other things. Now most trade unions have virtually no actual power. You know, maybe I don't know the biggest one, maybe the Teamsters Union. If they go on strike, they could do some damage, I suppose. But 
it's 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 a toothless sort of lion, isn't it now? Well, yeah, except in you know in places like the auto industry and other places, yeah. it isn't. But and and frankly, in the in in the public sector unions of police and and other mm, public yeah. sector sector workers. I mean, the, the 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 defanging and emasculating and crushing the unions. Apart from yes, some of them were racist. Yes, some of them were corrupt, and all those reasons that they didn't do themselves any favors mm -hmm. in the in the in the fifties and sixties. Part of the plan was to basically reduce reduce the power of workers at large, whether they were union members or not, in the system. And one way you do that is by crushing unions because there are a lot of people, a lot of workers in any given system who aren't members of a union, but who's who benefit as kind of free riders from being in a system and, or at a company where that is unionized. Right. Mm -hmm. So so no, the, I mean, unions were 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 slowly declining in membership uh, during the during the 60s and 70s. But then oh, as soon as Ronald Reagan became president, there was this big opportunity when the air traffic controllers went on strike who were federal employees. And, and whose union, whose newish union, had been one of the few unions to endorse Ronald Reagan for president months before. He said, now if you go on strike, I'm going to fire you all. And they didn't yeah. believe it because that's that's not what was done. They went on strike. He fired them all. And yeah. and uh, it, it, it uh, I mean, apart from the virtues of what they were demanding in, in 1981, the, the, it was this gigantic signal to unions, to workers, to companies and company managements that, oh, the game has changed, uh, uh, you know, and 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 immediately, I mean, you know, when every strike or not every strike, but all of these big strikes that happened all during the 80s, the, the employers, the big companies would would fire, would would bring mm -hmm. in replacement workers, scabs, yeah, scabs. And and then the then the strike would be over, usually with the union getting almost nothing. And the companies would say, sorry, you don't have a job anymore. These replacement mm -hmm. workers are t keeping your job and it happened again and again and again. So the crushing of unions was not the only thing that happened, uh, but it was one of the important things that happened because there are lots of ways for workers to, to have their, you know, to, to have a fair deal, right? I mean, minimum wages is one way. Um, um, having overtime pay is another. Those mm -hmm. two in their sneaky, stealthy ways start, well, thanks to the evil geniuses and uh, uh, Congress people in Washington, began being uh, uh, taken away uh, in the 1980s as well. And so, so across the board, unions and elsewhere, just the, the the leverage and power of workers was was denuded and 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 in a way that that just you know i mean the uk has its own version of this and other countries have their own versions but nowhere in the developed world what did it go from you know so quickly uh, to, to such a, a a crushing of of worker power mm. and and that's really hard to build back now you know you see some hopeful glimmers when this you know what was a seemed like a crazy proposition and just a few years ago oh, 15 dollars an hour minimum wage now it's completely normal and that's what most americans mm -hmm. think it ought to be so there are other ways than than recovering and restoring big powerful unions like the afl-cio and i'm not saying they shouldn't be recovered mm -hmm. and revived but there are other ways to to try to skin this cat and 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 restore you know a a, a fair balance between the mm -hmm. power of of owners and investors and and the power of the people who work for them and the power of you know citizens uh mm -hmm. who, who 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 you know are suffer from the monopolistic practices of yeah. all these big companies well and you bring out a lot of the statistics in the book and that's what i appreciate you kind of contextualize it for the reader going back and saying okay maybe maybe it wasn't entirely fair back in the Rockefeller and Carnegie days, you know, the strike breakers and all that. But at least the gap between the the wealthiest, the, the business owners and the corporations and the average employee wasn't that severe. But over the decades, you just chart it in the book, it gets the gulf gets wider and wider and wider till today. The average CEO of a company makes, you know, 1400 times or more yeah, yeah, yeah. Than what the you average know, line worker makes. And, and and again, that's a that's the result of a lot of things, changes of regulations, most of which none of us ever thought about or or cared about at the time they were being changed. Different laws, different tax, you know, lower mm -hmm. taxes on the wealthy, all those things, but also a kind of a kind of 
cultural propaganda campaign to to say that um, it's every person for himself for themselves and yeah. and 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 that's what made America great our our pioneers growing up by themselves and 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 that was a you know that was sold really effectively mm -hmm. in in a kind of as I make the case uh, in this in this appealing to Americans nostalgia for the old days and and oh, yes. and, and 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 you know. Uh, little did they know that they were that there was a lot of terrible things about the old days that they didn't want, but they weren't there so you, good. There you go. When we come back from the break, we're going to get into this issue of how did Donald Trump actually take advantage, ironically, of the situation created in large part by these evil geniuses that Kurt Anderson is talking about. And he was able to parlay that into his presidential election back in 2015, 2016, playing on the anger and the fears of his base in many states. And this is a huge irony, of course, as he himself was part of that sort of evil genius network going into his presidency. So. We're going to get into that as well as some other topics in the second half. I just wanted to mention what is coming up in the next few episodes here on Mindship Podcast. We finally have word that Rachel Bernstein is going to be releasing her half of the episode that we did actually a couple months ago now. She and I did two episodes back to back. One's going to drop on her show on the Indoctrination Podcast, and the other one is going to drop here next Wednesday as I'm doing this recording now, which is the 6th of October. So that that is really cool. I'm looking forward to that. Look for that second half of the episode coming out here on Mindship Podcast. And you can also head over to the Indoctrination Podcast to catch the first half of the chat that we did. Rachel and I had a fantastic conversation about religion and mental health. She's a therapist herself. She deals with a lot of people that have religious trauma syndrome as well as who are leaving religion and just trying to work that out process and, and build a new life, build a new identity. So that is a fantastic conversation. I've long wanted to talk to someone who was an expert on mental health and religion, the effects that religion can have on us in terms of our own mental health and what it takes to rebuild our identity. And then I had another really great conversation with Jonathan Larson. He is an editor over at TYT Network, the Young Turks Network. He's been doing, if you followed him at all on Twitter or on social media, he's been doing a really fantastic job and investigative reporting series on the TYT network on the family and this is the same group that Jeff Charlotte reported on uh, several years ago with his book The Family and then the follow-up to that which is C Street and of course that's the Netflix documentary The Family so if you don't know what that is go on to Netflix and watch that series on The Family or you can pick up Jeff Charlotte's book but basically what's happened I'll give you this little bit of a sneak preview of that conversation with Jonathan Larson he was able to get some of the invitation lists to the annual prayer breakfast, which is held in Washington, D.C. I believe it is every February. And the family is the one who's behind this. This is really the only public sort of event that they do. Everything else is designed to be secretive, under the table, under wraps, behind the scenes. They are a dominionist group. They've got stuff going on literally all over the world. And again, Jeff Charlotte touches on this in his book, The Family, and in the Netflix uh, series on The Family. So that's good to catch up on. But Jonathan Larson has been doing even more research into what The Family or the Fellowship Foundation has been doing around the world. So this is really an amazing conversation that I had. I think you're not going to want to miss that. So look for that episode coming up with Jonathan Larson. And then a couple of things as far as our Patreon supporters go. We've been having some amazing MindShift Zoom calls. We just had one last week as I'm doing this recording. We had David Johnson come in from the Skeptics and Seekers podcast, or I should say formerly of the Skeptics and Seekers podcast. He's no longer doing that show. He's working on some other stuff right now. That call, you can actually watch that call. It will be up on the MindShift podcast Facebook page. You can go to that page if you want to drop in and see what we talked about with David Johnson. That was another amazing conversation. And then in the month of October, we have Frank Schaefer coming in on the 24th of October. That is going to be our next MindShift Zoom call. And then I'm working on getting Jonathan Larson of the TYT Network. He's going to come in in November and be our guest then in that month. So some really fantastic guests coming up. I cannot wait to have Frank back in. I've had him on a couple times before. We're going to do a standalone episode on his new book as well. And also look for a discussion that we did. We had a group discussion a couple of months ago about his new book and that is going to drop 
probably on his Facebook page shortly before his new book drops, which I believe is early November, late October, something like that. So look out for that as well. So some fantastic stuff coming up with Frank Schaefer. I love Frank, love talking to Frank, and he's always just, it's an amazing conversation. So really cool. Looking forward to having Frank come back in and then Jonathan Larson in the month of November. All right, let's get on back into this conversation with Kurt Anderson as we finish up the second half of this conversation about his book, Evil Geniuses, and how he explains how the vast wealth inequality in America was no accident, but it was actually by design. Well, and it's so ironic, isn't it, that you look at the heartland of America, okay, there's steel mills that are closed down, coal mines that are shut down. A lot of that's the result of this strategy you're talking about. And yet, A guy like Donald Trump could come along in 2015, 2016 and make the case to these people in the heartland of America, we're going to reopen these factories, we're going to reopen these coal mines, we're going to put you back to work, even though it was complete nonsense, it couldn't happen, we're bringing the factories back. I mean, he lied through his teeth saying, you know, Toyota's coming in, Honda's coming in to places that had automotive workers, and when none of it was true. Uh, he didn't create millions of jobs in those kind of places. He didn't open up coal mines and steel plants and you know all that stuff. But he was building off of all this stuff that you describe in the book, and he was able to make it work. These are the Trumpists that are cheering because he's going to bring back the coal mining jobs. I mean, it's never going to happen. Yeah, and I just don't uh, – that, that's the part of it that, I mean, the the reality check. Like once once as it was immediately when when – the the lie was revealed immediately and and by yeah, the way, it, no it's, way. It's, it's it's what you say and more it's it's he said you know we're going to have a better healthcare system than we've ever had more yeah. generous you know uh, where i'm going to i'm going to uh, rich people like me are going to pay more in taxes wall street isn't going to be able to pick your pockets i mean he he you, i i encourage your listeners to listen look, look up google donald trump's final 2 minute ad in the 2016 campaign he, it could be a Bernie Sanders ad. I'm right. serious, and 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 of course, immediately he's elected. That no, nope, sorry, not going to do any of that. And in fact, the only my only legislative accomplishment is a 1.7 trillion dollar tax cut for the rich and big business. So how that keeps going, which I guess gets back to my previous book, Fantasyland, which is to say, you know, uh, logic and, and 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 critical thinking are not necessarily. Mm-hmm everyone's strong suits but it's it's amazing now i also think and i spend a lot of time in this book and evil genius is talking about how what a disservice so many democrats and liberals did by not presenting an alternative economic vision to the republicans for decades it takes a while you know it takes longer than six months of a biden administration to convince people who feel like you now these that that if they're middle class or working class that uh, there's no no not a bit of difference between the Republicans and Democrats. It takes a while of Democrats passing policies, you know, that actually put more money in people's pockets and are and show themselves to be not, you know, the pawns of Wall Street and all that. That yeah. I got to say, you know, for many years, it's been a hard thing for Democrats to defend themselves. So mm. we'll see. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, w- w- it's it's as I say. I mean. This the the left turn of the Biden administration in economics, which I think has surprised everyone, needs to you know have some time to play out before before it starts having I think political effects. Mm-hmm. It, again, it's a generational project. Well, and you, you talk about Reaganomics, trickle down economics, or whatever. Uh, there's a couple different names for it, isn't there? The idea you talked about earlier, you said that. If, if, if the Friedman Doctrine is correct, that the goal of corporations and the ultra wealthy is to maximize profit, if that were true and they shared it with the workers, <laughs> that wouldn't be such a bad thing that they're after. I mean, you, you have to make a profit to stay in business. Obviously, sure. you don't want to go out of business. But you find that over the decades, the trickle down economics didn't trickle down, did it? And well, that's the, 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 no. the rising tide didn't lift all the boats. And and it's amazing if if you look at the the, the those graphs of 1945 to now uh, of of productivity of profits of all, all of these economic indicators and uh, the median wage. You know, there the, all the boats were rising. All those lines were rising through the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, mm-hmm. and then they stopped. And productivity kept increasing and 
corporate profits kept increasing. And, and as you say, CEO salaries went stratospheric. But suddenly the, the other line, the line of, of median pay and, and, and what average Americans were, were earning start, went flatline. So, yeah. I mean, again, as one of the big points of the, the book is that that didn't happen by accident. It was right. a series of choices like, sure, in, in other countries, the, 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 there has been an increase in inequality in other developed countries, uh, income inequality. And, 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 you know, it's a global economy. And so technology and outsourcing of manufacturing and all that affects mm -hmm. everybody. But other countries had, an, had a, you know, fair enough, vibrant enough political economy that that the, 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 all of that unfairness, that new unfairness, that inequality was moderated. And so, you know, instead of going crazy and sorry, sorry, losers, you 80 percent of Americans who are losers, you're out of luck. Mm. You know, they 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 have tried in their various different ways, depending on what country you're in, to keep the boats rising together. And and mm. and, and and again, if anybody spends any time uh, looking at it, I, I just find it hard to believe that that they won't say, yeah, this 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 you know, this has been a raw deal. I, I, I used to, you know, I used to find Bernie Sanders a little annoying when he would just talk about the rigged system, the rigged system. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, okay, not a lot of nuance in that phrase repeated over and over again, <laughs> but it's true. You yeah, know, it, it, is. it is, it is a rigged system. And, 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 you know, Donald Trump said the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and we'll see. I, I just, I, I have, I, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's, and, and I do feel like it's a, it's a now or never moment. And I, and I feel some, some glimmers of hope, as I say, uh, mm -hmm. if we, you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of existential threats yeah. uh, going on, but, uh, you know, I'm, I haven't, I, I don't totally despair yet. There's some hope. Well, there's a connection to fantasy land. You mentioned nostalgia. And I was thinking that you talk about in the book, you talk about the fantasy industrial complex. One way for workers that are upset about the, the fact they're getting screwed is to go into the fantasy industrial complex. Isn't that part of what you talk about as well, that there's a million ways to escape reality. The right. reality is that you're getting screwed by your company, corporation, boss, whatever. Your wages have been flatlined while his has gone, you know, like you say, stratospheric. But you can cosplay, you can play video games, you can watch yeah. sports. There are a million things to distract you from reality. Right. And 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 uh, yes, it is. I mean, you know, it, it is the Brave New World story, mm -hmm. right? It's the Aldous yeah. Huxley story that he wrote 90, almost a century mm -hmm. ago. Um, and and yes, indeed. And and while this radical change has happened of, of the from the New Deal to, as I call it, the raw deal, like mm. virtually overnight, this odd thing happened where so many of the the, the, the the outward appearances of things, whether it's how cars looked or how music sounded or how, all of that didn't change so much. And, you know, yes, there's this in fantasy industrial complex into which people can sink and yeah, avoid de and avoid dealing with reality like on the on, on you know, Wall E sitting in their big yeah. park loungers. But um, uh, they um, you know, the, the fact that the the, the the change, this radical change that we never debated in this country, like, oh, should we have uh, top 1% be as rich as they were back mm -hmm. in 100 years ago? We never had that debate, but yeah. it was effectively decided. So there, there's this huge change, set of changes in our in, in, in what is considered fair and unfair and what is considered too much corporate power and all that. But hey, the music sounds the same. Hey, the cars look the same. Hey, it's 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 not so crazily different, yeah. you know. So so it's a yeah, it's a it's 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 tough to to uh, it's a it's a it's an interesting moment, you know, um, um, that we find ourselves at. I was just going to ask you about that because I was so fascinated. I've noticed that myself. And then when you started talking about it in the book, I thought, aha, he's going to go into this whole thing about you say that in every generation in the past. You could you could tell the differences in car design, fashion design, building design, home design, all those the music, you know, 40s is definitely definitely different from the 50s, from the 60s, 70s. But then in about what, early, early 1990s? Yeah, basically. everything just starts sounding the same. Look, I mean, now they're they're just making cars, you know, one factory will just make three or four different 
car make manufacturers just you just tell them your specifications they'll crank out a peugeot or a fiat or whatever and right. the same you know they all look the same music has been re- regurgitated i mean i love this, the old 60s and 70s and 80s because i think okay at least they were you know writing stuff like the who and led zeppelin no one's writing music like that anymore they're well they're just no, nobody, out crap aren't they well or or music that or music and graphic design and architecture that is just essentially in so much in so many cases just a cover version of what yeah. has come before and you know I, again i i don't think that my evil genius has caused that to happen but i do think it serves them and i think i think it is and it and it is an extension of this the nostalgia part of the fantasy industrial complex mm. which which really was industrialized in the 70s and 80s became a you know in movies and television and everywhere else became a a sector of the entertainment industry that that then naturally led to this kind of stasis where everything kind of seems the same. And, uh, you know, uh, here we are, you know, living yeah. in the Matrix. What now? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they're, they're about to come out with a new Matrix movie, I heard. So, you know, maybe, yes. maybe there's that's a prescient thing. Well, I have one last question. I'm kind of keeping uh-huh. an eye on the time, but sure. I'm fascinated now looking at the future. You, t- you say, OK, a guy like Jeff Bezos, he, he's a he's a poster child for everything you're arguing in the book. One of the richest, if not the richest men in the world, spends money on vanity projects like going into space and spends, I don't know how many millions, billions doing that, um, pays his workers fairly low wages. And he's actively working to replace them with automation, robots, which is a, a universal thing across the board as well. So a worker stability, worker um, you know, sort of going forward, where's their security? Uh, how, where's this thing going? Because automation and AI is is the wave of the future, isn't it? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And in fact, I just finished producing a podcast called um, The World As You'll Know It. That's about mm. the future of technology. We have a whole yeah. episode about artificial intelligence. Uh, and as you know, from the book, I was already, I spent a lot of time looking at that. And the, certainly the majority of experts believe that there simply aren't going to be enough jobs for human beings to do at a decent wage. We're not going mm-hmm. to need them because, you yeah, know, robot all, can do it. robots and AI can do what we need doing. And do better. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and that and, and the problem is that needn't be a disaster. Right. If we had a, a, a society where we shared the wealth more and and we 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 could begin sort of the slow glide path to an amazing future where you know people didn't have to work as much and people didn't have to work as hard and 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 but everybody who was living whether it's some form of universal basic income or whatever it is that it can be the best of times or it can be the worst of times Mm. and it's 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 our choice you know um because People say and have said, I think they're saying it less lately because it's so clear to me that the total automation of of middle class as well as working class jobs is going to just accelerate, proceed that. Oh, well, in the last industrial revolutions, you know, uh, in the early 20th century, in the early 19th century, you know, it it was painful for a while. But then great new jobs came Mm -hmm. along and people were employed in in factories instead of farms and then in offices instead of factories and so forth and so forth. Yeah, it's just. I mean, I think it's whistling past the graveyard uh, to to think that that is going to happen this time. I mean, if it does, okay, uh, uh, all of all of the experts in labor economics will be surprised because I just don't think it is. So what happens? You know, you, you know, especially in a country where if you're not working, you know, fifty, sixty hours a week, you're you're you're. You know that that is your identity, and what you're just going to take handouts. We have to rethink the whole idea of you know sharing social wealth. And I, I spend, as you know, a lot of time yeah. or a half a chapter, a little piece of a chapter in the book, talking about what Alaska has done for the last fifty years, which is yeah, I, I, I just I I'm find it in Alaska. <laughs> it, 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 well, it's an, it's an it is free money in this most yeah. right conservative yeah, libertarian Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin state yeah. uh, in America, where for fifty years after they ever since they had this big oil uh, strike in the, on the north shore or yeah. top of Alaska, they said, okay, we're going to take a big chunk of the royalties from the oil companies on this, and we're going to give it 
a lot of it directly to every Alaskan every year. Mm -hmm. So every man, woman, and child in Alaska for the last 50 years, it gets between a thousand and four thousand dollars a year, depending on how the stock market mm -hmm. does and so forth. So like 10 grand, 15 grand for a family yeah. of four. Pretty that's good money. Pr that's significant. Yeah. So, and, and, and again, you know, I mean, for all this talk in an, about calling every, anything that any Democrat in the United States does, well, that's socialism. We're, yeah, this is a socialist socialism. country. That is the, the most, the, the largest scale socialist experiment in this country ever. And everyone seems to love it. It was it was put in place by a Republican governor, expanded by Republican Governor Sarah Palin, and the uh, majority Republican citizens of Alaska would would kill you if you tried to take it away from them. Mm -hmm. Well, it all goes back to the Simpsons, doesn't it? Because in the Simpsons movie, they move to Alaska, and as they drive across the border, they they check in, and this guy hands Homer a big wad of cash. You know, it says, "Welcome to Alaska." You know, so finally he says, "I'm getting something here." You know, I'm getting something back. It's so true, isn't it? Yeah. But that's my concern, isn't it, that I, I work in the construction sector, and I, I love watching these videos about new bricklaying robots and 3D printing of houses. And part of me says, I love technology. I have to teach construction theory. So I, I do preview a lot of this stuff because it is coming. There's no escaping that. But part of me says, yeah, but that's replacing, you know, 10 skilled bricklayers or whoever, what what happens to those bricklayers when the houses are all 3D printed? What happens to the carpenters and the, you know, everybody else? Where are they going to go? No. Uh, nobody yeah, seems to have an answer. Because it requires a radical rethinking of yeah. economically and culturally, like, what what is life all about? I mean, yeah, we know it's about loving the, your friends and, and having nice gardens and raising good children and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But like, this is going to require a massive change if if there just aren't enough hours of labor that human beings need to do and there mm. won't be there will be less and less and so you know it's been written that there we we risk having the useless class as mm -hmm. as more and more people just become you know are, are no longer economically important yeah, well violent. what are they and and yeah, and and, 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 and we have to start rethinking of of what makes you know a, a, a good and worthy life i mean john maynard Keynes, i talk about in the book you know a, almost 100 years ago said in about 100 years if we keep you know efficiency uh keeps increasing through automation and 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 the gross domestic product keeps increasing as it has in about 100 years there's gonna be enough money and enough wealth created that we're, there's enough and here yeah, we are enough here we are at, about at that point and and uh and as he said again in 1930 that's going to be a real problem to figure out how after centuries and centuries of scraping and suffering and 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 and, and dealing with the economic problem of scarcity what do we do well so far we're i mean we we again i'm I, I take little bits of hope from mm. um, Andrew Yang in the last election and, you know, putting universal basic income on the American political agenda as mm -hmm. as a way to, 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 to deal with this problem. So people are beginning to think about it in a way they just weren't even, you know, mm -hmm. five or 10 years ago. But but it's it's huge. And 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 it is and it is amazing to me that it, it, it you know, it, it could be. Uh, an extraordinary on on the line between dystopia and utopia, and you know, utopia could be annoying, and yeah. there's no such thing probably as well. But but we we have the opportunity with AI, I believe, to get a lot closer to utopia. But right now, the mm. way things are set up, uh, as a, thanks to the evil geniuses, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we're, we're our destination is dystopia. In, 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 in given yeah. what what what's going to happen with AI and 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 how things are produced and made? Yeah, well, and it's like you say, it is the future, and there's no question about it. That is where technology is going. You say in the book, robots are getting cheaper, they're getting better, they're more effective at doing more and more tasks. Uh, so it's going to come to the point when, and it is already happening, isn't it? You walk through any factory today, oh. half or more of the machines in there are robotic doing menial tasks that humans used to do and right. that's all and that's going to continue happening right no and we just we have to you know we have to figure out how, how to deal with that and yeah. uh, we've barely begun we barely begun well i think you need to go convince jeff bezos to share <laughs> some of his money that's, my, that's next on my agenda yes he, that's he the could. irony of the whole thing isn't it guys yeah. like 
Bezos and Bill Gates, and they they have. I mean, you, we can't even wrap our heads around how much money they actually have versus what they actually give back, what they could do with that wealth. Um, instead, they're you know hoarding it for themselves. I don't know. So yeah, that's a hard call. It, it, well, yeah, it's not that hard. Well, uh, to get, I'm talking about to get him to share it. <laughs> yeah, but but I but you know you the, you look at the polling about uh, should rich people what do you think of a wealth tax, for instance, mm -hmm. which is a crazy radical thing. You know, large majorities of Americans say that's a good idea. Yeah, guys with a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars should have to pay a lot more in taxes. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a consensus around that. It just it has to. You know, it has to start being done. And, and as I say, the government and democratically run governments in the United States have to start showing that, no, government is not incompetent. Government can help you. Government is here, mm -hmm. is you, and it's here to help you and yeah. and uh, so forth. So we'll see. we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I know you're kind of on holiday or vacation, but yeah. I really appreciate it. The book is Evil Geniuses. The Unmaking of America, A Recent History, came out in 2020. If you haven't read it, hopefully this discussion has been thought-provoking enough, you'll go out and buy the book. So the other question is then how can people find you? Where's the best place to get a hold of you in, on social media? Uh, my main social media presence is on Twitter, where I am at KB Anderson, and Anderson is spelled S-E-N. And uh, I've got mm -hmm. a website, which is KurtAnderson.com. Okay, thank you so much, Kurt Anderson. I've absolutely enjoyed coming back around, talking about evil geniuses. I wish we could talk again. I hope we can talk again another time. I'd love to talk to you if you're up Great. for it. Thank you, Clint. It's it always a pleasure. Thank you very I can much. Say it, it's always a pleasure because it's been twice now. So anyway. it's, it's been twice. We Thanks. can make it a third time if you want. There you go. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll speak to you soon. Great.